Greetings! In this video we're going to look at socket testers. Not these new LED based ones though. We're going to go old school and look at some of the neon ones. We've got three lined up. This one is an old Martindale tester I picked up from eBay. This is a newer one you'll find on the Amazon. And this is one I've cobbled together for this video. Before we look inside, let's test them side by side in different fault scenarios. As you can see, the homemade and the Martindale ones behave exactly the same way, but the indicators in the one from Amazon behave completely differently. A key difference, and one which you'll see on a lot of the newer LED based ones, such as this QCheck 105, is that all three lights on is good, whereas on the others shown here, all three lights indicate an earth fault. So how do they work? We'll look at the homemade one first, as it's the easiest to understand, not to mention the easiest to take apart. This quality enclosure cost me £2.95 and came with a free mushroom fried rice. All it contains is three neon indicators, each of which has a resistor, and three diodes. If you look at the schematic, you can see it's fairly straightforward. The diodes are there just so it can differentiate between more faults. Without these, you can see that a no neutral fault would actually light all three neons as power could flow from live through lamp 1 and lamp 2 in series. That would mean the tester couldn't tell the difference between a no neutral fault and no earth fault. With the diodes in place, this path is blocked. D2 can also be reversed and it will still work, but the indicator pattern, as you can see, would then change. So it's a fairly straightforward design to get your head around. You can see the way power flows through it and work out how it's going to act. I made a four neon version of this a few years ago for use with the traveling show band. This was built into an old laptop power supply case with an IEC inlet at the end and was much the same design as you see here but had a fourth LED and a higher value resistor you'd normally find in a neon test screwdriver and that went from the earth connection to a bare screw on the case. This extra connection overruled any other test results as it indicated that relative to wherever you were standing on or otherwise in contact with, the earth connection was actually live. Next up, let's look at this old Martindale. I have no idea exactly how old it is. Underneath this cap on the back, there is a flat blade screw. So you see what's inside. Four resistors, no diodes. Let's look around the front. This was glued in place until I pried it off. Behind that we have the label and then behind that we have three neons all connected in series with connections going through to the resistors behind. The schematic shows that instead of each neon having its own resistor, each pair of neons shares a resistor with a fourth one feeding in from the live pin. It can't be done with just three 66k resistors as it would then light all three for both no earth and no neutral faults. So the four resistor method allows those two faults to be differentiated. So a lower component count for the same range of test results. Although the resistor values aren't so straightforward so obviously some more thought had to go into this design. Now let's take a look at this cheapy one from Amazon. Remember that this one has a completely different set of indications depending on the fault, with all three lights indicating no fault found. How can they have done that? Wow. They've done the whole thing with resistors. Lots and lots of different value resistors. There's nothing actually underneath the board at all, just the just the supply pins, which screw straight through there. 
Let's take a look at the schematic. Now the circuit may look quite simple at first, but the more you try to understand it, the trickier it gets, because it's basically a mesh of potential dividers with three supply points, each of which could either be live, grounded, floating, or even centre tapped. Let's take point D for example. If the socket's wired normally, this has got two 33k resistors in parallel pulling it down, and a 33 and a 39k resistor pulling it up. From that, it's relatively easy to calculate the voltage that should be found at point D, which you then got to use to calculate the voltage at point B, B being important as this is the voltage across the neon, at least until the neon strikes, more on that later. But D is effectively a high resistance supply, the 33k and 39k percent are divided between this and the 240 volt supply is pulling them up, so it's going to be higher than zero. You can calculate it if neutral and earth are connected properly as they're both tied together further along the incoming supply line. You can also calculate it if earth is disconnected, as R2 is the bottom end of the divider, and R458 in parallel with R3 and R7 make up the top end. But what if you want to go even further down the rabbit hole? What if it's connected to a centre tap supply, such as a 220 volt output in the US, or possibly a generator supply? Now point D is a 33k pull down, a 33k pulling up to 120 volts, which would make it 60 volts, but again, its high resistance means it's going to get pulled up further by the potential divider. You can try to calculate the voltages at these various points to try and figure out the potential across each neon for each scenario and determine which ones were light. Unfortunately, these calculations don't take into consideration the voltage drop across the neons once they hit the strike voltage and start pulling things about. Just because someone puts a bunch of formulae in front of you doesn't make them correct. The calculations in this spreadsheet would only be correct if the neons weren't fitted. Here we have a neon with a current limiting resistor. This meter is across the neon itself. This meter is across the entire supply and the variac is controlling them all. And you'll see as I dial it up, the voltages go up in step. Until the neon strikes, Now it's pulling that voltage back down and you can see even though the voltage climbs quite rapidly on the input, the, the neon is clamping that voltage down. So we now have a voltage limit which needs to be factored into that calculation spreadsheet. Trouble is, it's not just one voltage limit, it varies with the applied voltage. It also changes if you change the neon bulb, as different bulbs can have different characteristics. This means that the spreadsheet, although very detailed, isn't up to the job. For example, cranking up the voltage on the spreadsheet to 250 volts gives a prediction that all three neons would indicate even if there's an earth fault. In practice, it doesn't happen. Clearly a lot of thought went into what looks like such a simple circuit. I suspect a lot of thought plus some trial and error to tweak the final values. And for what? Just to make it so that all three lights mean good instead of two? Maybe. Maybe not. There's one more thing worth looking at, and that's the way the testers react when there's other equipment in the circuit being tested. In this case, two other designs of tester. It's actually something I stumbled across when setting up this video. As you can see, the two simpler designs misinterpret a missing neutral fault. The Martindale thinks that live and earth are reversed. The homemade one thinks it's an earth fault. Remove the Amazon one, and the homemade one now thinks everything's okay. It's only when the Martindale is removed as well does it show the correct fault. Obviously these are very odd devices to have plugged into the circuit, but it just goes to show how other equipment can have an effect on the results. Even something as simple as a neon indicator can cause the tester to throw an incorrect fault code. The one which seems to be immune to this is the cheap tester with the weird resistor network. The one from Amazon. Although even that can have problems if it's in the same circuit as the Q-check. This thinks we've got a live earth reverse fault. This now thinks everything's okay. 
So, I hope you found at least one bit of that video interesting. My money's on the bit with the neon and the two meters, or perhaps that last bit. Anyway, thanks for watching.